So, hey, thanks everybody for coming. Um, uh, my name is, is Dr. Will Douglas. Uh, I'm the artist in residence at Southwestern Baptist in, in, in Fort Worth, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I've really enjoyed all the events. And has everybody gotten the chance to meet Pepe already? Sure. You have? Yeah, yeah he's wonderful. Um, this is my third visit up here to teach, and I'm always very, very uh, honored and happy to be here. Uh, Matt is a really dear friend of mine, and I always appreciate uh, being a part of these events that he puts on. We are very lucky students to have someone like him who really knows what he's doing. He's sort of respected all over the country. So um, anyhow, so w would you mind introduce yourself and the piece you're gonna play, and we'll, we'll get started. Yes, uh, do you need the piece on this side? Or? Uh, after you play it, it's fine. It's okay, so. yeah, so my name is uh, Rogelio Jimenez. I am a senior for uh, class in FES, and I will be playing Songs of the Mother by Johannes Muller. <laughs> Thank you. 
Very nice. Well, I do know this piece very well. I, I haven't played it myself, but actually I did my dissertation on Johannes Muller piece. And I know him pretty well. Um, let's see, would you mind give me your fifth string real quick so we're in tune together? Okay, good. So I want to talk a little bit about the right hand technique. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I noticed uh, you tend to favor P for the sort of strong melody, right? And 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 sometimes you're planting fingers on the on the soundboard or on s strings, right? So non-playing fingers on the string on the strings. Um, what, do you have a, a reason that you, you like to do that? Is it is there some technical? Uh, I just found it easier to do, especially mm -hmm. because I believe I know the story behind it. Mm -hmm. I'm not completely sure. However, I think that just for um, just for sound purposes, it mm -hmm. feels a little better than to play it with a thumb or to play it with a nail. Yeah, and it feels better. It sounds better to play it with the uh, flesh. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. I think that the that's right. Yeah. I mean, you definitely the thumb is a bit more powerful, and and that's how he plays it. Right, and I think it's notated that way, isn't it? Yep, yeah. there's P there. Um, you know, so I think that that's absolutely the approach. What I would be careful of, right, is is planting the fingers on the soundboard or the, the strings. And there's a, a, a couple of reasons why. So we, we tend to do that, especially kind of earlier in our development, because it feels stable, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, we do this, like when we're learning to strum, we'll put the finger on the, on the pick guard, you know, or when we're playing with our other fingers, we'll do this to try to, try to kind of anchor ourselves, right? But when you think about what, what is an anchor for? I mean, generally, not just, not our hands, but like a boat anchor. To keep the boat still. To keep the boat still, right? What we want for our right hand in our playing is freedom, right? And with freedom <laughs> comes responsibility, <laughs> right? It just, in guitar as in life. And that, what, I, what I mean specifically is that that we we want to, to practice with the right hand in such a way that gives us a maximum range of movement so that we can explore all the color that the guitar has to offer and all the subtleties that the guitar has to offer and when we anchor we end up putting our hand in one fixed position and then to get out of it we have to make kind of large movements right so if we find ourselves playing a piece where we're going back and forth between fast arpeggios and scales and blocked chords, we're constantly having to shift our technique very, very rapidly. But what that does is it costs us time, right? And as you, you may know, in faster pieces, we don't have a lot of time. So for whether we're playing a piece that will afford us that time or not, we don't wanna make that a part of our technique because it will be something that, say, when we get nervous, we'll, we'll tend to fall back on, right? So uh, the other reason is whenever we're playing um, and we're locking our fingers into a position, so these three fingers actually attach down here together. And as you get older, like me, um, if, you, if, you, if the fingers, uh, if you have some fingers that are planted on the guitar and others that are moving, those tendons actually fight against each other and it can cause some injury in the hand over time. You know, things like carpal tunnel, right? So that attachment right there where the, where the muscle and the tendon come together can start to get inflamed and it can actually cause, cause an injury, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna play with all the expression that you have, but we wanna do it in a way that allows you the most freedom possible, which will allow your skills to sort of develop over time, right? Um, the other thing I was noticing is, is when, when you were kind of shifting like this, you had a very strong, warm, beautiful sound with P, but with these fingers, it was not quite as strong. So the sort of third part of that where we're anchoring is it puts our hand in kind of a passive position like this. And what I mean is the, the weight of my hand is not over the strings. So one of the things that our, the weight of our hand helps us with is to help move the string so that when we push against that string, and that string is, is kind of pushing back against us, we have that natural gravity of our body, right? So we don't have to work as hard to get a nice, powerful sound out of the guitar. So you've already got a beautiful tone. What I what I want is for everybody out there to hear it as well as I'm hearing it sitting next to you. 
okay? So if you wouldn't mind, can we start the piece again and we'll kind of talk through that a little bit as we go along. Good. So let's talk about that little that that finger drag right there. So, you know, when, when we're doing when we're doing this, we want to really have control over over uh, the, that rhythm, right? And control over the dynamic too, right? So if you want to go from forte to piano or piano to forte, you can really do it with a lot of precision. Typically what we like to do is actually move from the shoulder. So we kind of create this sort of, it's, it's like a tool or a rake that we're creating here. We have a little bit of give in the joint so that we can come through easily, but that effort actually comes from the shoulder, right? So, so when we play, This time, when you when you come through, don't let your wrist collapse. Let, let it come through straight with the shoulder. Let it all all here, right? This way. Is that in your way? My eyes are older than yours. <laughs> so so one more time. Good good. Again, so remember from from the shoulder. weight of that as you're doing that. All right, do it again. Good, good. We see this a lot in guitar playing. Do you know Villalobos, the, the uh, Etude 11? It has a similar thing in it. You heard that one? Yeah. It's the, it's the same move, right? It's the same, it's the same technique. So this is one we see a lot. Now in, in that particular Etude, that's a very almost this is a very kind of uh, heavy-handed etude, that one, right? This is more delicate. So you wouldn't necessarily put that kind of weight, weight here, but it is this sort of technique and playing from the shoulder and, and kind of keeping this sort of fixed position will allow you to, to either add or remove pressure a little bit more easily without feeling like you have to really, you know, crank down on the string, okay? Good, so can we, let's, let's start again and, and then move forward. Good, good. So, so here, I feel like you could actually take a nice big breath right here after this first one, and then the same thing here, right? Because each one is kind of this, it's like a rhetorical statement, right? You're, you're, you have this statement, you know, it, the, this uh, little opening, what, one measure, this is all one measure, right? And then you have this, which is almost like a like an and or a but between two ideas, right? So uh, try it again. And nice big breath here, and then same thing here. Nice big breath there. Sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead, try it, try it again. Let's do it from the top again. Okay, ready?
Pianissimo, right? There you can really, now, so, interesting. So we have a, have Pianissimo, we have the, this here. At the beginning, we have a mezzo forte, and we don't have anything between, right? So what does that mean? Does that mean we're mezzo forte the whole way through until right when we hear, the we see the Pianissimo, or what, what's happening? I interpret it as the, um, the main melody gets emphasized, but those, um, those drags that I do, as you described as like a an and or but I, the conjunction moreover, mm -hmm. I played them softer. Mm -hmm. Usually in a sentence, I wouldn't get emphasized. Yeah, no, I I think that's 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 wonderful, uh, and and what and well played. So, you know, when we when we see, we just have these two indications, but that you know, of course that doesn't mean in terms of the dynamic that we should play mezzo forte all the way right until there. And yes, the conjunction. Uh, you know, they're, they are definitely softer, but would you play each one of these statements mezzo forte or uh, not? No, I think I would play the, the third measure a little softer. Right, yeah, sure, okay, great. So let's, let's see how we can make that happen. So we wanna open this up mezzo forte, and we wanna be able to make, we wanna make sure that that, that dynamic that, you're, that you're, um, you're, you're trying to, you know, portray to the audience that that dynamic is actually carried through, right? So the guitar is a very subtle instrument, right? And it doesn't like it doesn't need our help being subtle. It's very small in its sound compared to other instruments. So when we perform, a, a lot of the dynamic that we are feeling in here and in here isn't necessarily coming across as clearly to the audience, right? We lose something around. 20% of our sound by the time it hits the end of the stage, right? And so along with that goes some of our interpretive depth, right? So if you're thinking mezzo forte here, and you're saying, and you're thinking maybe forte, I'm just, for example, right? Mm -hmm. You would wanna play that more like mezzo piano and forte, or me mezzo piano and double forte, right? Because, because the guitar is so subtle, right? We really kinda have to exaggerate ham it up, right, on, on this instrument, whereas on a, 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 an instrument that is more, has more sonority to it, there's more volume, right, you wouldn't necessarily have to work quite so hard, right? So what I'd like you to do is with each of these statements, make a different decision, right? Make a different decision. You, it can be totally spontaneous in the moment, whatever you're feeling, but be very sensitive in the hand, right? So if you want to get louder, get louder, right? Like really mean it. If you want to get softer, then then you know, really really feel that. Okay. Okay, so I like I like what you're doing here. We have this very free introduction, like almost like a little prelude, a very improvised feeling. And then down here we have quarter notes and eighth notes that are. I mean, the the, the, the rhythmic structure even on the page becomes very obvious, if not just to to the ears. And I think that that was coming through really, really, really nicely. Um, could you bring the melody out a little more here? Just a little bit, uh, a little bit more dynamic, a little louder. Now, on those harmonics. So harmonics are tricky. There's a couple of ways that we can play that will allow us to, to play harmonics a bit louder. One is with nails. Right, the, the nail allows us to bring out more of that partial in the sound and, and makes um, uh, the harmonic more direct, right? It carries much, much further and it's clearer, right? Now I notice you don't have much thumbnail there, a little bit. Uh, do, do you, you do grow your nails out, I, I notice. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm working on going on my thumbnail a little more. Yeah, it's tricky, right? You you know, um, famous uh, guitarist Julian Bream. No, I do not. He's he's kind of one of the great guitarists of the 20th century. Actually, sadly, we just lost him about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, uh, but he used to joke. He said, "I love my nails for about two hours every month <laughs> <laughs> because they're so hard to grow out and maintain." Right. Um, there's lots of great options out there. I use a dip nail. I actually go to a salon and have them put on because I have a I have a five year old and I chase her around and I break nails all the time, so I found it easier to put fakes on. Um, uh, but there are some that you can order that you can that are temporary that that have little glue dots that are great solutions. That actually, sound really nice. I have a number of students that use those. Um, but that notwithstanding, when it comes to harmonics, the nail can be very very helpful. And you may have already noticed this. You typically have a longer nail. Um, the other thing is, if we're playing over here, kind of where the, the string is much more flexible, it's not as loud, right? So if I play up over the sound hole and, I'm, and I do, the, do those, uh, those harmonics, it's a, it's a much softer sound. Whereas if I play back here, near the bridge, they're very bright and clear, right? So uh, can you try this passage again? Because I noticed you were playing a, a, a bit over the sound hole. So back up a little bit and play, play this passage and see if we can't bring those harmonics as well as that, that the counter melody out a little more. Are you hearing any difference? Yeah, it's a little more defined. Yeah, a little bit. Now, the other, the other side, I, I noticed there's some discoloration in the strings. And that, that's the other thing that really can hobble the clarity of, of, of harmonics is if you have older strings, right? That the, um, so on classical guitars, it's different from all our, the ancestors of this instrument, like lutes and baroque guitars. On those instruments, you really had to use the flesh because the partials or that, the bright sounds were much easier to be heard on those much uh, more f uh, flexible instruments. They're very, very thin top. So you, they use the flesh to help bring out the the the, uh, the fundamental of the sound, that pure, warm sound that we you know associate with say the classical guitar, right? The modern classical guitar. So that's the sort of fundamental part of the note, right? Um, so uh, that means if we want to have that sort of brilliant sound, uh, it, it can be a, it can be more challenging, right? To sort of balance that because either we get really naily and too thin, <laughs> and nobody wants that, or it's really warm and dark and can kind of make the music a little bit muddy. All, especially if you're playing something like this that has a lot of parts to it, it can make hearing all those different parts and how they, they move not as easy. So one, one easy way to fix that is actually just new strings, right? New strings will help bring that brilliance out so those, the, the partials in the note are clearer. You get this sort of bright brilliance, but you also get those really rich, warm sounds that we associate with, with so much of the repertoire that we love, right? So I think, um, just looking at your technique here, I say by and large, it looks great. Right? So I think, I think just a couple of easy things, right? So just changing the hand position a little bit, right? Will help bring out those, uh, uh, the harmonics and then, and then changing your strings. Right? So I wish everything was that easy to fix, <laughs> okay? Um, so can we start that section again there? So, so when we're when we're when we're playing these high, um, da, 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 that's here, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, when we're playing those slurs, do you do any slurring exercises at all? Uh, no, I do not. Okay, so um, there are there are three things in in our technique ex technical exercises daily that we don't want to miss out on, right? So arpeggios, slurs, and scales, and actually in that order, right? So arpeggios, and I, I recommend arpeggios on open strings so you can really pay attention just to your right hand. There's loads and loads of wonderful studies, right? Uh, Giuliani studies, there's the Segreras method, you know, there's, uh, of course, there's, uh, what, Brower Etude 6, you know, there's, 
the Villalobos 1801. There's all of these wonderful right-hand studies, but they bring in the left hand. As soon as we start thinking about two hands, it can, as many of you may already know, as soon as you add another hand, it can start to make things a lot more difficult. So that first part of your daily technique diet should be some kind of arpeggio warm-up workout with no left hand whatsoever, right? The second part ought to be some slurs, right? So you have arpeggio for the right hand, slurs for the left hand. So two of the, the most uh, taxing, energy expensive things we do on, on guitar are slurs. And can you guess what the other one is? The arpeggios. Uh, or for, or, I'm sorry, for the left hand. Oh, the, yeah. Scale. So, so for the left hand, what is the, typically for most people, what's the hardest thing to do for the left hand? The t most tiring, I'll say. I would say something requiring speed. How about a bar chord? A bar chord. <laughs> right, yeah. So, I mean, for most of us, when we're first starting out, a bar chord is kind of a nightmare, right? Uh, um, so, so, but, but the other one is slurs, right? Slurs require the left hand to take care of, you know, the, the, the lion's share of the art articulation, really. You know, so you may, with the right hand, start the first note, but you could have, you know, any, any number of things happening above it. So having some kind of, of, of series of slur exercises to strengthen that will do a couple of things. It'll make your slurs great. It'll also make your hands faster and stronger, right? So for example, here, uh, you, could, you could actually even use this passage uh, as kind of a slur warm up, but let's, let's just do something simpler, okay? So uh, we'll start out with just a pair of fingers, right? All right, and so I'm gonna play one, slurring up to two, and then play two and slur down to one, and then one, and slurring up to two, and then two to one, right? And then I'll do the opposite. I'll do two to one, and then one to two, two to one, one to two, and then one to two. Okay, so when we're, we're slurring, and this, this comes from a, a, a book by a good friend of mine, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you a, a copy of it. I've got it on my iPad, and I can kind of show you where to get it. It's got a ton of really great uh, exercises in it. Um, but um, any, anyhow, so let, let's talk about, uh, about how we actually execute the slur so that we can make this passage clearer and easier for you, right? So an ascending slur, or what we call a hammer-on, right? This is sort of the guitar, the guitar, uh, like, slang for it, right? But lots of instruments have ascending slurs, right? So uh, I, don't, I don't super love the description hammer-on, and it's not for any particular reason other than it makes people think you're actually having to hammer your guitar, right? You're trying to whack it as hard as you can. Ascending slur, we're not trying to do that at all. All we're trying to do is quickly seat the string against the fret wire. So I'm gonna play, and then I seat quickly against the fret wire, right? So it doesn't need all that wind up, right? So, so if you start really close, there we go. That's it. Because if I go, if I whack the string really hard, I really don't get any more dynamic out of it, right? Right, and this is, this is true for, uh, you know, classical guitars, steel string guitars, especially electric guitars, right? Because the pickups do the work for you, right? So you can be light as light as can be. It will work maybe a little harder on a classical guitar, but not much, all right? Good. And now the descending slur is kind of like a left-handed rest stroke, right? So I play and I snap downward, right? And I want all of that, that action to come from the knuckles. That way I'm not pulling my hand. I'm not using like my elbow or my shoulder or anything to do, to do the slur, right? So we're gonna play here and then good. Slurring up and then So what I would suggest is go through and try this on every combination of two fingers that you can think of, right? So one and two, two and three, three and four, and then and then pairs of fingers that aren't next to each other. So you know two and four, one and three, and one and four. And again, I have I have a, a, a workout sheet that I can I can share with you later later on. Just just remind me, and I'll, I'll, and I'll show it to you. Okay, great. Um, so do you have any questions about that? Uh, no, I think we can move on. Okay, okay, great. 
Um, so there's that section towards the end I just wanted to remark about that's the arpeggio section right at the end of the piece. Let's see, here, right? This is, oh no, it starts, what does it start? This, it's this, yes? Or no, that's the, that that's the, arpeggio? yes, the, yeah, the final from here, actually. Yeah. That, this, this, that, that, from right there, if you don't mind, or, or there. Good. Okay. All right. So, so I think um, a couple of things. Um, you want to be really mindful of repeating fingers. I, I, I am an A. There's what, what happens is we can only play so fast with one finger, and it also can be very exhausting, especially if you're you know, 40 like me, <laughs> right? So we want to try to get as many fingers involved as we can, as is reasonable to. We can make things too complicated, right? But you 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 want to try to kind of offload some of that work that you're doing off of just the one finger, like, you know, so in other words, kind of sharing the love. And it'll allow you to play much faster and with a lot more clarity, right? And this is one of the things I think that happens with a, a, lot, of, a lot of guitar players. Did you start out on classical? Uh, no, I started on electric. Me too, me too. Um, so it, w because of that, I, I think many, many guitar players with that background, our left hand tends to be ahead of our right hand, right? Our left hand is just better than our right hand for a while. And it takes a good a good bit of time to get them to 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 catch up, right? And we'll tr we'll tend to lean on one finger. This finger is the most independent one, right? It's got its own tendon and muscle down here, and it moves very easily by itself. These two, not so much, right? Right. So so what? As we're going through this, can you can you start the section again here? Now, now, can you give me a bit more volume? So th th it's this place here where we're getting these the 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 two the two D's right before the slur. It's right, those the two notes right before the slur each time because you're in da dum da 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 da. And I'm hearing a little bit of some staccato in between those two notes where the other ones are nice and legato. And that what's happening is that because you're returning with the same finger, that same finger is slightly late, just like a little bit. So can you, can you try P, I, P, I, M? Slow. just that one part. You're already kind of getting it. But do you see what you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, your 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 eye finger isn't having to work as hard, right? And th this will allow you some room to think about articulation. Right, so that th th here's the funny thing about the guitar that's really, really unique. There's a lot of things about the guitar that make it uniquely challenging. The thing about guitar and sound production, I think, that makes it very, very unique is that our relationship with the right hand and the length of the note, it's kind of a-durational, right? Meaning, if I'm playing a whole note or I'm playing a 30-second note, my right hand's relationship with that note is the exact same amount of time. It's plunk. Right? So the only moment that counts is that one moment when we make contact with the string. It's like if you are a tennis player and you had the advantage of you could like freeze the ball on the tennis racket and then experiment with the angle and then unfreeze it and see what happens, right? On the guitar, we can do that. You can't in tennis, unfortunately, right? I mean, I don't play tennis, but it seems like it would be a great thing to be able to do. 
on a guitar, we can. We can plant on the string, right, and feel where the string is on the fingertip. And then when we release it, we can listen to the sound and decide whether or not we like that sound. And then we can try to replicate it. Or if we don't like that sound, we can make an adjustment. We can file our nail. We can, we can change how far we push the string, right? So the good news is, you know, that's the only mo moment that counts. The bad news is, that's the only moment that counts, right? So if it's not a good moment, that note is not gonna have a good moment for however long it rings, whether it's a 30 second note or a whole note, right? So I'd say there's a couple of things that you can do to really make a lot of strides with this piece right here. One, one is um, new strings, right? Maybe a little bit of thumbnail to play back here for, for, for the, um, uh, those harmonics. And the other one is try experimenting a little bit with this dragging of the shoulder through the string for that. And, and then lastly, go in and, and actually write in your right hand fingers, the ones that you're using, mm -hmm. right? Uh, don't worry about what, what Johannes has in the score here. You know, take a look and see where you're repeating fingers, especially in fast passages, right? And then just go in and kind of work through those very slowly, right? And because what I saw as we, we started to, to pick up speed and you were trying this new fingering, you got it. It actually didn't take you very much time at all, which is awesome. That's really good, right? So it's just a matter, I think, of noticing them and then just making some, yeah, some corrections, okay? And on the um, topic of changing strings, mm -hmm. how often would you recommend that I change them? How often do you play? Uh, maybe two to three hours a day. Oh, that's good, good. Uh, so um, I, I tend to change my bass strings and my treble strings at a different rate, right? Because the bass strings oxidize because of the metal and they get kind of, the tone gets bad and the shimmer wears off pretty quickly. Uh, I change my bass strings about every seven to 10 days and I change my treble strings about every 14 days, right? Um, but I spend a, a lot, I, I teach a lot. And so, uh, you know, that, that might be a, a little excessive. I would say, you know, as much as you play, I wouldn't go more than a month on a set of strings, it, you know? Um, and, you know, I recommend, when, if you practice a lot, um, D'Addario Pro Art strings are great because they're, they're, they're really consistent strings. They have a nice sound to them and they're, they're not expensive, you know, as far as strings go. You know, you can pay a ton for strings if you want. And you can get packs of two and three of them, you know, for under, I think under $30 for, for, for I think three sets, you know, and then, and then you're good for two, three months, right? Um, but I would definitely, especially, you obviously love to play, and I can tell by the wear and tear on the strings that you, that you play a lot, right? And electric guitar habits. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah I, well, my, I have very oily skin. That's another thing. If your skin is oily, you're gonna wear your strings down faster. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to change my electric guitar strings a lot, right? A lot, a lot, um, because they're so thin and they're metal, right? Um, but, uh, but my classical strings, um, uh, the, the nylon strings resist oil a little bit better, so you don't have to change them as much. Right? But those wound strings, they, they, they corrode. So uh, anyways, anything else? Uh, no, that was about it. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Great playing. Who is, who is next? All right. And do you need to see the music or you got it memorized? All right. And which one are you playing? Oh, right there. And you say just the A section? Yes. Cool.
Very good. Thank you. Um, so, so before we get started, do you have any any specific questions about the piece? Okay. All right. So, um, do you know much about the composer? Godfather of Bach Symphony. That's that's you, you nailed it. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So so um, uh, Francisco Targo is the the Godfather of the modern the modern guitar, right? He, he played. The, do you know the guitar he played? That's okay. That's okay. So uh, Antonio de Torres, right? So just guitar history lesson. Has anybody heard that name before, Torres? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Maybe sort of. So Antonio de Torres, uh, uh, luthier through the eighteen, the late later part of the, the 19th century, the 1800s, right? Uh, he's the one who gave us a guitar that looks like this, right? So prior to that, the, the, the guitars were smaller, uh, they were quieter, you know, and, and actually the guitar almost went extinct. Um, the the uh, advent of the of the modern manufacturing process for the piano had come uh, 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 had arrived, excuse me, in, in Europe, and pianos became easier for people to acquire, and and so lots of music was being written for piano for people to play in their homes, and all of a sudden the, the smaller, quieter guitar became less popular, right? Well, along came Torres and Targa, and thankfully saved the guitar for for all of us, right? So he was um, the first great virtuoso and composer for the instrument that you and I are both holding right now. Um, and he had uh, three uh, students, uh, Miguel Yobet, Daniel Cortea, and Emilio Pujol, uh, who then became teachers and the rest is history, right? So now, and then we go down a few steps and there, there you sit and here I, I sit, right? Um, so amongst that, the tremendous amount of music that he wrote. There's a couple of pieces that are definitely the most popular, right? Capriccio Autorbe is one of them. The other one is, is probably Recuerdo de Alhambra, right? The, the, the tremolo piece, right? Um, so when, you, when you're playing this, what, what, are you, what, what does it make you think of? That's a good thing to be sure. I just, it's a piece that makes me feel emotional. Okay. I'm not sure why, but just whatever. I, I can tell <laughs> that comes across your playing, which is which is excellent. Um, so, can you kind of tell me just in this this opening little statement here, what what is what is that feeling? What is that? What's what is being evoked by that? At first, it's supposed to be a well, like it's almost a feeling of calm, but then with the uh, ascending scale, it's excitement, I guess. Okay. All right. So, can you play this again? And and when you play the harmonics, let them to sort of ring out for a bit, right? And, and this, this line here, beginning with, with, the, uh, with the G, right? Let that sort of slide out from underneath that. So you have this right, with the harmonic. And then this sound that sort of just sort of seems to slip out from underneath this big sound, right? time but this time right before you play that G take a nice deep breath in and play that G as you exhale So it's good to learn to breathe with our phrases, right? So we, in instrumental music, you know, we aren't singing, right? But, but we are sort of imitating that, that way of communicating, right? We, we, are, we think of phrasing in music the way we think of phrasing when we speak. I mean, it is called phrasing after all, right? And by breathing, it allows us to feel that sort of natural movement of the phrase. Right, and it helps us relax. Right, 
it's hard to relax if you feel anxious, if you're holding your breath, your, bra your brain goes into panic mode. It goes, I'm not getting any oxygen, time to freak out, right? But if, if, we, if we breathe well, it will help us bring that anxiety down. It'll help us bring our body into control so that we can spend more of our time thinking about the music itself. Because right? this is beautiful music. It will play itself, you know, if you get all the notes right, but it's so much better if we're able to put ourself into the music, right? And nerves can be a big barrier for that, right? Has, who, who in here has dealt with stage fright before? I have, right? And, and so breathing can help us, getting our body into the right place can help us, and then hearing the music before we play it, right? Having an idea of where we want to go with it before, rather than we just sort of like throw ourselves off a musical cliff. It's like, oh, I'm gonna start, notes are coming out. I don't know, <laughs> you know. Now, I, don't, I didn't get that impression from you, but that is a habit that many people have. They'll get on stage, you'll feel rushed, right? And then you start playing. But if you breathe and take a moment to yourself, the audience is okay with it, I promise, right? And then allow that music to come out, okay? Can you start it again? Good, and there too, we, it's beautiful sort of. The E wants to become that C sharp very badly, right? right? But we have to, we have to, we have to let let that that. We have to want to, to let that that E want to be the C sharp. So give it a moment. So try that again. Now, now with a little bit of an accent on that E, right? Um, the T. Better? A little more. T. Can you give me a nice rest rope? Just like that now, uh, we're gonna start a little bit softer here. Now, and then one more, one more little detail which can help. Try this, so P, I, M, and A, all, all planted. practice it a bit right so so now now all of that from the very beginning all the way through that good now one last thing and then we'll move on so here when we're connecting we, we want to hear Go of that E too early. Don't let it. Don't let go of the E so that you can get to the C sharp or the A major chord. Right. We want to try to make the, the E connect to the C sharp. Better. Better. You see. You see what I'm saying? Right. That that allow the melody to sort of connect because it does. The E wants to become C sharp. Good. Um, so uh, let's continue. Okay. Good. All right. So um, this is a kind of a tough passage, right? We have we have what a couple of sixteenth notes, six tuplets, and then we've got what. Uh, 30 second note run there don't don't rush it 
we really want to try to just land on one in the next in the next measure, right? Um, but I'd, I'd actually like to kind of move on to the next se section, if that's okay with you, where we start getting into this more rhythmic bit. <laughs> Good. All right. So, so I, I I see what you're getting at with the with sort of this uh, more rhythmic or or the the pause that you're you have. That pause. But but it might be a little too much because before we've had this very free thing happening, and all of a sudden we're getting boom, 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 boom. we're finally getting kind of a rhythm to it, right? So we don't want to overdo that. Maybe. You know, when we have some of these ideas come back, we can take a little bit more of, of a breath. So we want to make sure the audience kind of understands the rhythmic space that we're in before we start taking them all over the, the galaxy, right? So, so can we try this again? So, so here, there, there are kind of two ways we can accent notes, make, make interesting moments. And w w one is uh, a, a, a dynamic accent, right, where we're play louder. Right? Another one is an agogic accent, right? which is this fancy musical term meaning messing with the length of a note. Right? So, so you can elongate the note or you can make it a staccato note or something like that, right, to create an accent. And I think um, that if you want to go here and, and when we, we end up on this, this chord, this A7 chord, you want to make a dynamic accent there to bring that out and then coming back down so you end up with something more like. Uh, something like that, or even rolling the chord slightly, that can really add a lot. But I would be careful kind of with the, with the, um, with, with, with the uh, taking too much time, right? So um, does that make sense? Good. All right, well, I think you have a, a, a really good start on the piece. Do you have any, any questions? Good, good, thank you, thanks for playing.